Thank you, Madam Chair. 2021 was the year of the cryptocurrency. More Americans than ever are taking notice of this transformational technology. DeFi, DAOs, NFTs, Web3, jargon that was really once just used on crypto Twitter, they are quickly becoming part of the lexicon. Technology and its adoption are moving fast. Entrepreneurs and innovators are building and deploying the next generation of the internet. And firms like the ones before us uh, are the on-ramp for many Americans to participate in the digital asset ecosystem. But this panel is only a bit of that broad ecosystem, and this is the first time Congress is having a hearing about cryptocurrencies in its fullness. But as with any new and fast-growing industry, there are questions that need to be answered. I want to be clear, though. This technology is already regulated. Now, the regulations may be clunky. They may not be up to date. I ask my friends, my policymaker friends here on the Hill, this question. Do you know enough about this technology to have a serious debate? Now, if the answer is no, then we need to first seek to understand, to build up that understanding of this new technology so we can have a serious debate on what, how we appropriately respond and update regulations and perhaps laws. But I should be clear, the goal today is to listen, learn, and ask questions. This technology is new and exciting. It promises a new direction for financial economies, services, and products. I further ask this question, though. How do we make sure, as American policymakers, that this cryptocurrency revolution, this technology revolution, happens in the U.S. and not overseas? There are a lot of questions we have to answer. But of course, we need reasonable rules of the road. We know that. We don't need knee-jerk reactions by lawmakers to regulate out of fear of the unknown rather than seeking to understand. And that fear of the unknown um, and the move to regulate before understanding uh, will only stifle American ingenuity and put us at a competitive disadvantage. Throughout history, we've seen examples, countless uh, uh, harmful ex uh, examples of overregulation around the world by governments. In the late 1800s, England reacted to the rise of cars with laws that required three people to operate vehicles at all times. One to drive, a second to fuel up the vehicle, and a third to stand in front of the car and wave a red flag. Now, Congress should not be dumb enough to ra raise a, web, uh, a red flag around this technology revolution. We should embrace it, we should understand it, and we should be the uh, international leaders in this space. Further example I would tell you is Skype. Uh, the video conferencing platform that, you know, may still be a little clunky, but was vital uh, during the uh, COVID shutdowns that we just experienced. Um, and uh, it was vital for some, some of our kids to even go to school uh, or even have uh, hearings on this uh, massive screen here. You know, Skype was illegal in most of the world when it was launched. There wasn't a regulatory infrastructure in place that allowed this novel technology, this new technology. And finally, when an invention called the Internet began to boom, U.S. lawmakers and regulators struggled to fully grasp the immense uh, possibilities of this innovation out the gate. Now, that was the early 90s, and I think we're in a similar state with Web3 uh, 30 years later for Congress first to understand before we would seek to legislate. Now, it would be nearly impossible to go a day without using the Internet to communicate. We know that. Or move from point A to point B. We know that. Or purchase necessities for our families. We know that. I would argue that the nascent technology we're discussing today will have just as much impact on our daily lives, perhaps more. And that's why we must get this right. My fear, however, is that uh, we'll have a partisan divide here. Well, my fear is that some of my Democrat colleagues have already made up their minds, and they have regulatory bills that they're going to file uh, in order to stifle this innovation or to kill it before it fully grows and blossoms. I hope we can work together in a bipartisan way, and I hope this hearing is first of many for us to understand uh, and get clarity from innovators and entrepreneurs about what is needed. This will allow us, uh, which I, I think should allow us uh, to have these markets thrive and grow while protecting our consumers and giving clear rules of the road to prevent fraud and manipulation. 
Forcing the private sector to navigate unclear public statements and regulation by enforcement is the wrong approach. So is demonizing an entire industry based off the headlines garnered by a few bad actors. Understandably, there are concerns with the use of cryptocurrencies for nefarious activities. Let me address that. You know what else is used for nefarious activities? Cash. Um, so let's dispel the rumor now that digital asset technology is a looming threat to our financial system. Instead, we should work to fully understand the opportunities the next generation of the Internet could provide to Americans. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses. I look forward to having a deeper understanding as a policymaker about the ramifications for action by Congress before we understand this new technology that is now actually a decade old. So with that, Madam Chair, thank you for having the hearing. Thank you for working with us on a bipartisan panel. And I hope members will take the same spirit of bipartisan cooperation in their questioning and their seeking to understand. With that, I yield back. Americans deserve to know what our national policy is for a decentralized Web3 powered by crypto assets. Treating crypto as a single unitary activity whose main feature is a need for financial regulation would be like treating the original internet in the 1990s as primarily a tax policy issue. We didn't do that then. What we had in the 1990s with respect to Web1 that we lack today with respect to crypto is a comprehensive national policy predicated first on the notion of do no harm to the emerging network. Today, instead of focusing only on micro questions, such as whether a particular token is a security or whether a particular exchange traded fund may be offered, it would be worthwhile for the elected branches of government to grapple with the bigger questions, such as, do we believe a user-controlled decentralized internet is better than an internet largely controlled by five big companies? Do we believe that the financial services sector is any less subject to network effects than information and commerce were in earlier iterations of the internet? Do we trust big banks more or open source software more as a tool for maintaining ledgers of account and allocating credit and capital? Can we recognize the difference between crypto projects failing for lack of demand, just as many publicly traded companies fail, and the difference between individual crypto projects actually being scams unworthy of being presented to the fair but sometimes harsh judgment of markets? Crypto policy should take into account not only any new risks introduced into the system, but also the risk in the present system that are solved by decentralization. Having issued almost a billion dollars in civil money penalties against banks and bank executives during my tenure leading the Office of the Controller of the Currency, it is clear to me that the present financial system has plenty of examples of risks and costs and safety and soundness problems that are being addressed in the current system. Shouldn't we take uh, seriously the possibility that algorithms and open source software that take a measure of human error, greed, negligence, fraud, and bias out of the system might actually make the system better on net, even if there are some new risks being presented that need to be understood and regulated? Point specific to my current perspective on the crypto economy. One relates to the effect uh, of US crypto regulation on American competitiveness in both the technology and capital market sectors. There are a number of examples of US regulatory decisions that have driven legitimate activity offshore in ways that harm US investors, innovators, and workers. Can anyone explain, for example, why Fidelity Investments, one of America's best known investment advisors, had to go to Canada to offer a Bitcoin ETF? Or why physically settled crypto ETFs are safe and legal in Germany, Brazil, Singapore, and elsewhere, but somehow not in the United States. Can anyone explain why crypto exchanges, stablecoin issuers, and others can receive e-money licenses to access the payment system in the United Kingdom, but in the United States are reserved exclusively for chartered banks, with the result that the GDP cost of the payment system in the US is roughly four times the cost in the UK? For that matter, why is there no clear path for crypto-focused insured depositories chartered in the state of Wyoming to access Federal Reserve payment services like other insured depositories? These are the big questions that I hope to address today. Thank you, Madam Chairman, Ranking Member Henry. Which indicates to us that crypto has moved past its initial investment phase, and we are now in the long-expected utility phase of this ecosystem. Since our founding, Coinbase has strived to be the most secure, trusted, and legally compliant bridge to the crypto economy. Coinbase is federally registered as a money services business with FinCEN. 
licensed as a money transmitter in 42 states, holds a bit license and trust charter from the New York Department of Financial Services, and we are authorized to engage in consumer lending in 15 states. We have a robust AML BSA program, and we are one of only two digital asset members of the Department of Treasury's Bank Secrecy Act Advisory Group. In addition to the various state regulatory regimes, we are subject to federal oversight from Treasury, the CFTC, SEC, FTC, and CFPB. Much like the adoption curve of the internet in the 1990s, we are seeing dramatic advancements in crypto participation. There are more than 220 million crypto holders globally. And around 16% of Americans have invested in, traded, or used cryptocurrency. Total crypto market capitalization at the end of the third quarter was over $2 trillion, up from $800 billion as of the end of the 2020. Coinbase's platform is powering the crypto economy, a new financial system for the internet age, which we believe is a critical infrastructure layer to Web 3.0. Technologies like non-fungible tokens, which we call NFTs, and decentralized application platforms will lead the way to Web 3.0, which will revolutionize the internet. Much like the industry was revolutionized when it went from static content to the dynamic engagement content we have today. We believe sound regulation is central to fueling crypto innovation and adoption. That is why we introduced our digital asset policy proposal, which we refer to as DApp. The DAP assessed the challenges of the existing regulatory framework and proposed a four-pillar solution. First, we believe the government should recognize digital assets under a new comprehensive framework that recognizes the unique technological and innovations underpinning digital assets. Second, the responsibility for this new framework should be assigned to a single federal regulator. This regulator would be charged with establishing a registration process for intermediaries, which we refer, refer to as marketplaces for digital assets. Third, this new framework should have three goals to ensure holders of digital assets are empowered and protected. A, we believe in enhanced transparency through robust and appropriate disclosure requirements. B, we want to protect against fraud and market manipulation. And C, we want to promote efficiency and strengthen our market resiliency. Our fourth and final pillar is to ensure that regulatory solutions promote interoperability and fair competition. In conclusion, Coinbase believes crypto will drive transformational change across society in positive ways. This is why our mission is to promote economic freedom around the world. Disruption always challenges the status quo, but we believe sound policies can improve the system for everyone. We applaud Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, and the members of this committee for holding this important hearing. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss these important issues, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Brooks, let, let's step back from digital assets and blockchain for a moment. Let's talk about where the internet was, where it's come to, where it's going, right? We ha we're trying to level set here for policymakers. So originally, the internet was a read-only format, in essence. We're consuming information. And then there's additional layers that we place on. It became much more interactive. But Counterintuitively, much more interactive, but much more centralized in Web 1, Web 2. What we're hearing now is Web 3. Policymakers need to understand the nature of Web 3. This is a hearing about a component of Web 3. Now, along those lines, what are the characteristics that defined Web 1 and Web 2? Mr. McHenry, thank you very much for that question. I think that's critical to understanding what we're all trying to build here. <clears throat> so the characteristic of Web 1, if people remember their original AOL account, was an ability to look in a curated walled garden at a set of content that was not interactive but was presented to you on AOL the way that Time Magazine used to show you the articles they wanted you to see inside of their magazine. Just you could see it on a screen. The innovation of Web 2 was that suddenly you could not only read content, but you could also write content. This is when the blogosphere became a, a big thing. People remember this from the late 90s, the early 2000s. <clears throat> the reason for the centralization of the internet, of course, was that all of that activity 
was being monetized by a very small number of companies. Facebook, as the chairwoman, the chairwoman mentions, Google, and two or three other companies. What makes Web3 different is the ability to own the actual network. And that's what crypto assets themselves represent, is an ownership stake in an underlying network. So when you hear people talk about, for example, layer one tokens, what they mean is, this is your reward for providing the ledger maintenance services, the computing power to the network that on web one and two was done by Google, right? So now people in my hometown of Pueblo, Colorado can actually own the Ethereum network, but they can't own the internet. That's owned by Google and a few other companies. That's what the project of crypto is all about, is allowing people to directly own the networks that are, have native assets that are supporting it. And that's the nature of decentralization where the token holders are the people who control the asset, okay. not so the Google. Token holders, for, for our language here on the Hill, those are digital assets, right, which are the keys to open up the ledger for you to participate, right? Correct. So describe to us how those digital assets fit into this Internet revolution, Web3. <clears throat> so, so, so the concept is that you have sort of application layer tokens and you have protocol layer tokens. So if I'm an owner of Bitcoin, let's say that I'm a miner of Bitcoin, somebody who actually creates Bitcoin. The Bitcoin is the reward I receive for doing the work to keep the network operational. And that allows me to own a piece of the Bitcoin blockchain. Or take Ethereum, which is easier to understand. The Ether token represents an ownership stake in the network, but on top of that network are all kinds of apps that get built on the network, much like the apps on your phone depend on the underlying network existing that lets the phone operate. And so people will make judgments about which network is likely to win, and they will invest in the tokens in that network much the same way you might invest in Google stock because you think Google is going to scale access to the original internet. The difference being here, you can vote on what happens in the future of a proof of stake network, for example. You can get rewarded through a proof of work token for maintaining a ledger on something like Bitcoin. But the real message here is that what happens on the decentralized internet is decided by the investors versus what happens on the main internet is decided by Twitter, Facebook, Google, and a small number of other companies. Okay, so getting this, this layer of, on digital assets right, for Congress to understand this, everything is built upon that, uh, that, uh, that uh, on-ramp to this new internet. So very important for us to be sensitive to how this de develops and any actions we take in terms of uh, laws and, and updating laws to incorporate these new technologies. Yeah, it, Mr. McHenry couldn't agree more. And, and I think when you hear about all of the problems of different big tech companies, the importance of an owner-controlled network becomes clear. Okay, owner-controlled network rather than a cooperative, right? And, yes. and thinking in those terms, Absolutely. right? So if you're not a part of management, you're not making a decision in Web 2. If you are a participant in the network, you're, you're, making, uh, you're cooperating in the making of those decisions. E exactly okay. right. So I ask this not to be insulting to the panel, but to have a level set here so we have an understanding of what we're talking about. This is not simply <clears throat> about you on this panel. It is about trillions of dollars of assets that did not exist before Satoshi wrote his white paper 13 years ago. It's about $3 trillion in, in notional value at this stage around the development of a whole new range, a whole new suite of technology that will be developed across the globe, whether or not the United States embraces it and wants to compete or if it's pushed offshore. So as policymakers, we need to understand what we're talking about here. This is a small panel, important as you may be, a small panel about the discussion about Web3. And so with that, Madam Chair, thank you uh, for having this hearing, and I hope that we can have more understanding by policymakers about these important concepts. Thank you, Mr. Brooks. At what point should we become concerned about the possibility of a bubble? Uh, let's start, if we may, uh, with Mr. Uh, Brian Brooks. Well, thank you, Congressman Green. It's, it's terrific to see you again, and I always find your questions extremely perceptive. <clears throat> what I would say about that question is um, a lot of the price volatility of cryptocurrency has to do with the early stage of the market and the thinly traded nature of the asset compared to, for example, U.S. real estate, global equities, or, or anything like that. I think uh, the message I'd land with this committee in response to your question, however, is some of the things that make U.S. equity and debt markets 
more stable and less volatile have to do with the fact that there's a lot more price discovery in those areas. And what I mean by that is, you know, in the U.S., we have regulated equity mutual funds. We have derivatives products and futures products that allow the free trading on a 24-7 basis that provides the market with forecasts of what's happening in the, in the ecosystem. In the world of crypto, the U.S. hasn't responded by developing those tools for price discovery yet. And so the result in a relatively new, relatively thinly traded market is that one person unwinding their position can have a massive effect on the price. The last point I would just make very quickly is something like 80% of Bitcoin holders have never sold a Bitcoin. And so when you hear about a day when there was a giant price drop in Bitcoin, often it turns out that there was one or two large traders who were, who were unwinding a leveraged position, and the vast majority of holders have enough confidence in it that they've literally never sold a unit of it. So I would argue we need more liquidity and more price discovery to tamp down volatility, not less. So one of the things we hear about blockchain is that it's invulnerable, it's impenetrable, it's, uh, you know, something that's super secure. And our, our responsibility is to make sure that things are generally safe, generally honest, that people aren't swindled. So I also sit on the science committee with Mr. Luke DeMeyer, and, and uh, the ranking member was talking about we're at W3, all right? In the science committee, we're doing a lot with on quantum computing. And so my question to you is, what threats or benefits to a blockchain system uh, will come from quantum computing? Uh, well, thank you for the question. Um, I, in terms of the threats, I, you know, some cryptographic algorithms are not, at least theoretically, might not be secure under quantum computing. Obviously, this is going to depend on the exact details of what comes. Um, and it's important that, you know, if and when that comes, um, that, you know, blockchain security algorithms are resistant to that. You know, on the same front, I think it has the potential to create, uh, you know, basically new uh, cryptographic algorithms that are faster, that are more secure, and that are, uh, you know, more efficient um, from a number of different perspectives. Uh, so we'll, we'll see what happens there. All right, I have a million other questions, but I don't have enough time to ask them. I'll yield back. <laughs> Mr. Brooks, I will start with you. Um, uh, and this is a bit of a follow-up to Ms. Wagner's question, but do you think Congress needs to introduce legislation to provide more definitional clarity with respect to digital assets? And if so, do you have any uh, specific suggestions? Well, I, uh, I really appreciate that question. That is the most important issue in the short term for the industry. And, and so let me just pick up where Mrs. Wagner left off. If the question is, is the current test clear, it's clear in the sense that we know what it is. It's not clear in that it's a four-factor balancing test. So I often think about what uh, like the U.S. trucking industry would be like if the truckers didn't know that the speed limit was 75 miles an hour, they just had a four-factor test of general safety, having to do with how much sleep they got the night before, the overall size of their payload, and other factors. People need to know what the speed limit is. In my old agency, the OCC, what would happen is a bank would come to us with a new activity proposal, and we would give them an answer. We would either give them a non-objection, or we would not give them a non-objection, and it was very clear whether they would be allowed to access that. What happens in the United States is uh, you have a new crypto project and you walk into the SEC and you describe it in great detail and you ask for guidance and they say, we can't tell you, and you list it at your own peril. So whether this comes from legislation that defines what is a security and what isn't a security, or whether it comes from Congress in the form of legislative discretion to an agency to say what is a security, I would argue that a four-factor balancing test is no better here than it is as truckers drive down the highway guessing what safe is. Yeah, and Chairman Gensler has been quoted as saying the test to determine whether a crypto asset is a security is clear. Mr. Brooks, do you agree that that test is clear? I, I take it from your previous answer, the answer is no. But could you walk me through the process that exists today to determine if a digital asset is a security? Yeah, well, well, thank you for that. The, the best test that is out there is a test that several of us on this panel actually helped to develop about three years ago as part of an industry organization called the Crypto Rating Council. Uh, when I came to see several of you several years ago in connection with the Crypto Rating Council, the way I described it to you was it's sort of like motion picture ratings for crypto. Uh, we don't know authoritatively what's a security and what isn't because no authority will, will tell us. 
But what we can do at least is we can tell you the difference between an R-rated asset and a PG-rated asset, and people can make their risk tolerance judgments. So the way that process works is it's an objective, quantitatively based process that asks several dozen questions about the asset across each of the dimensions of the Howey test. It gives you a number, and that number tells you how close you might be to danger and how far away you let, are. Let me interrupt and just say uh, I recognize that some rules or federal regulation of both digital assets and, and cryptocurrency trading platforms might be supportive of bringing clarity, but I'd never underestimate the ability of the federal government and regulators to uh, stifle innovation. Can you give me an example of, uh, uh, of an overreach that would stifle innovation? Well, the, the idea would be to say to let uh, traveler's checks inside, exist inside the banking system and not bring a stablecoin issuer inside the banking system when they've applied. Thank you, Madam Chair. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm a small <laughs> business owner in, uh, in Texas and uh, still own those businesses. I'm a car dealer and a former professional baseball player. And when I'm trying to wrap my head around a new topic like cryptocurrencies, I try to relate it back to something I understand like baseball or business. Now, some of you may know this, but modern day baseball can really be attributed to Babe Ruth. He brought in the live ball era of the time and introduced power to the baseball diamond. And before this, teams would play small ball uh, that was very conservative, where teams would literally play for one run a game. The entire objective was simply to get the ball in play so they could try to steal their way around the base pass. And there was nothing wrong with this old way of playing, but when the White Sox won the World Series, in 1906, the entire team had a total of six home runs all year. But Babe Ruth came along. Babe Ruth came along and totally changed everything. In 1920, he set the American League record of home runs with 54. To put that into perspective how fantastic this feat was at the time, the previous mark to, uh, to be set was by Sox Seabold in 1902 with just 16. This introduced an entire generation of new baseball fans, and for the first time ever, the New York Yankees, over one million fans, came to see them in a single season. Now, with that being said, many of you are becoming the Babe Ruth in the financial uh, space, services space. You're introducing a blockchain technology to the financial services industry and working to upend the tradition and the traditional way of doing business. And while many economists and so-called experts have been calling on the downfall of cryptocurrency and discounting the future of blockchain technologies, all of you, uh, we're working tirelessly to create something new in order to bring this new technology to the masses. Unfortunately, uh, it would only take a few misguided curveballs, we'll say, uh, from Washington to undo some of the progress you've all put into this motion. So my first question to you, Mr. Brooks, uh, can you talk about some of the negative consequences that could happen if we take a heavy-handed approach to regulating this developing technology? Well, Mr. Williams, as a long-suffering Dodgers fan, I share a lot of the things you're talking about. And I think the era you're talking about was an era when baseball went from focusing on not losing to an era where it focused on winning. And winning and not losing are not the same thing. So I come back to Mr. Vargas's question a second ago, which I think is the right way to answer your question. You know, Mr. Vargas asked the question of um, people have the potential to lose a lot of money. These things are volatile. They're risky. How do we protect them from those kinds of issues? There are two ways of answering that. One is to prevent as many people as possible from accessing this amazing technology. For, for example, the way the current legal regime works is certain kinds of assets can only be purchased by accredited investors, meaning rich people. So the only people who can get rich on this are people who are already rich. That'd be one way of protecting people from losing money, is to make sure that only the richest can access it. Another way of addressing it would be to make it safer the way that we made equities safer 40 years ago. Right? We created mutual funds, diversification, sector funds, and other things that make it easier for regular Americans from places like my hometown in Colorado to buy equities without having to be stock experts. Strangely, in the U.S., we've refused to do that so far. So we don't allow crypto mutual funds. We don't allow people to diversify the way that they do in Canada, Germany, Singapore, the United Arab Emirates, and a series of other regulated economies around the world. So I would argue the way to win is to bring more people into the system more safely, not to keep them out at their own peril. I'm going to interject. Um, Mr. Brooks, I have a question about the challenge of enforcing laws in a world of decentralization, uh, whether it be law enforcement relating to financial crimes or SEC disclosure. How exactly do you enforce the law when there is no central entity against which to enforce the law? 
How do we grapple with that challenge? That, that is a great question, Mr. Torres. I really appreciate you asking it. So I'd say a couple things about it. First of all, to the extent that some of the activity we're talking about is parallel to activity that happens in the supervised system, my question is, why don't we allow it in the supervised system? Again, you've heard me say it before this morning, but you have on this panel a big stablecoin issuer who's applied for a bank charter. Doesn't look like they're going to get it. Easiest way to supervise that would be to let them in the banking system and have the OCC have authority over them. So I'd start with that. The second point is, lots of these decentralization protocols are designed to solve the exact problems that create the need for enforcement in the first place. Because most enforcement in the securities and banking system is about some combination of human error, human negligence, human greed, or human bias. And the point of some of these decentralized systems is to take that out and have an open source piece of software where everybody can look at and do with those things algorithmically. So as an example, I used to sit on a bank credit committee. We would decide who got credit and who didn't. And I think we had a really good system for it, but we were human beings. We might have been indulging in implicit bias. We might have made mistakes. Algorithms don't do that. So some of the need for what you're talking about goes away in a decentralized system. And I know there are, you know, there are critics who have said that the blockchain might not be as secure and as unhackable as advertised. But for me, the proper question is not whether the blockchain is perfectly secure and unhackable. The question is whether it's better than everything else. Like Winston Churchill famously said, democracy is the worst form of government with the exception of everything else. Is there a computer network that is more secure than the blockchain? Well, I, I think the beauty of the blockchain is not that it's perfectly secure, it's that it's perfectly transparent. So you can see when somebody's screwed around. But I want to specifically address security. Is there a computer network, to your knowledge, that is more secure than the blockchain? I don't know of one, but we have a PhD in physics sitting right next to me. So we'll let him, uh, we'll let him answer. <laughs> uh, if you're talking about any major globally used blockchain, I don't know of one. There are small blockchains that are less secure. All the major ones are incredibly secure. I, I'm going to have to move really quickly. I'm going to go to Mr. Brooks on a couple of things. Um, would you describe why establishing these clear rules of the road is important? Uh, before we, uh, an important step before we uh, add additional regulation and, and, and consider that regulation? Well, Mr. Heisinger, it's good to see you again. I think the most important reason of many is international competitiveness. So other countries make this easier. Okay, let me just make clear. Other companies make this easier, other countries. I just came yesterday from the Middle East where in Dubai and Abu Dhabi they have super clear derivatives regulations, super clear ETF regulation. They're trying to lure Americans over there to build these products, and they're moving there. So, so how are they viewing these crypto assets differently than traditional assets? I mean, I, I, what, what, have they, what, if, what Rubicon have they crossed that, that, that we haven't? And um, you know, why is it important to think about digital assets differently? Well, I, I think one of the things that they've figured out is that um, crypto actually is less fundamentally different than equities and debt than you think it is. It's a risk on asset that people want to invest in. They want to invest it in Canada, so Canada builds a regime for it. They want to do it in Germany. Germany, it's, we're the last country standing that hasn't figured that out. It's a risk on asset that people want exposure to as part of asset diversification. As opposed to traditional assets. Correct. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for having this hearing. I think it's very intriguing um, and, and you know, very timely with uh, where we are with the progression of technology. I, I go back and I think about my 30 years I spent in the IT field. Um, uh, had the government gotten in the way of the Internet, we would still be using dial-up today to do a lot of what we're doing. So I think we have to proceed very cautiously. One thing I've learned in the 30 years in the IT sector, um, especially 10 years that I spent in the intelligence realm in the Air Force, is uh, the, the most important aspect from an IT perspective is data security, cybersecurity. It's something we have to be focused on all the time. In fact, in my business, 20 years in the private sector, um, that was the number one issue for most of my customers. And really got to the point when I ran for Congress, of course, I couldn't continue that business. I sold it primarily because I knew that under the, the way things were, is it, the question wasn't if someone was going to be hacked and lose data, it was when. And uh, so uh, one of the things that I learned when I was in, uh, in the military is one principle is you don't have to secure what you don't have. So if you don't need data, don't keep it. 
But then you have the aspect of, yes, we have to secure the data that we do need to keep. Now, this is one thing that the federal government has yet to learn, is you don't need to acquire a whole lot of data and keep that data, especially if you're the federal government, which is the riskiest of any one out there of, of letting data get out. Um, and then you see more proposals like the one that we've heard recently with the craziest proposal is the banks have to report every transaction by Americans and their banks to the federal government. This is the type of thing that we don't need to be doing. However, there is data that is important that we do have, whether you're in the private sector, or whether you're in public sector. And that's where I see the value of the underlying technology of cryptocurrency, particularly blockchain, is a solution to our cybersecurity problems because of the distributed ledger aspect of it. Is the data is available but is not centrally located to where it could be taken. Mr. Brooks, um, can you discuss how blockchain and distributed ledger technology can enhance our cybersecurity posture? Well, Mr. Loudermilk, it's good to see you and I appreciate the question. The, um the, the simplest answer, as I said earlier today, is that blockchains are as much about transparency as they are about security. <clears throat> so one of the biggest problems when you think about the biggest cyber hacks we've ever had in the United States is how long it took for us to figure out that they occurred. The case of Target, the case of Equifax, some of these things. We found out days and weeks later <clears throat> by accident that they occurred. And if you think about the Equifax hack in particular, initially we thought it was a small problem. Weeks later, we learned it was a medium-sized problem, and only months later did we learn it was a gigantic problem that involved all of our data, because there was no transparency. The thing about blockchains is, every single block as it is validated is publicly visible to the network. The other thing about blockchain is it's based on a consensus mechanism. So before you can have a change to the ledger, you have to have a significant majority of all of the validators agree that that's the correct change. And so, unlike normal networks where one bad guy can defeat the entire system, here you have to have thousands of computers agreeing at the same time that the change can be made, and even then everyone sees it. That hiding in plain sight aspect is the safest thing about blockchain. It's why it's so critical to our security infrastructure. And I think that's one of the most key values of this emerging technology, is bringing us into a new era where we can do some of the things that we need to do without amassing this data. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I truly appreciate this hearing. This is a great hearing. I want to start with Mr. Brooks, uh, and I'm going to attempt to respond to some of the objections, which I believe demonstrate a complete and utter misunderstanding of what we're even doing here today. Uh, one contention is that the vibe of crypto is a stick it to the man vibe, but in actuality, it's dominated and controlled by big tech and Wall Street. Uh, while the culture may be somewhat accurately described, the notion that a handful of big tech leaders and Wall Street banks somehow created and now control crypto uh, is absurd on its face. And frankly, anyone who would make such a claim, I believe, should be ignored on this topic. Uh, my contention is that Web3, crypto, blockchain, etc., by its very structure, has the ability to solve some of the most difficult and frustrating problems that the current version of the internet and the financial system have where a narrow set of platforms control what we see, how we interact, and what we buy, while millions of Americans remain completely disconnected from the financial system. Web3 can turn this entire thing on its head in a very empowering way. So my question's simple. How specifically could you see Web3 solving some of these bigger challenges associated with the current version of the internet and the financial system? <clears throat> Look, Congressman Gonzalez, thanks for the, for the question. When I go back to the criticisms that you're just recounting, the only part of that I heard was hip. I, I'm going with hip. The rest of it, you know, we can come to. But in terms of the problems being solved, I, I think the first issue is the biggest critics of cryptocurrency have been the biggest banks. Those are the people who are the most concerned about the entry of stable coins into the payment system, about the ability of crypto assets to build networks that are away from the clearinghouse. Those are the biggest critics. And so I think that, that tells you a lot of what you need to know. And the reason is because the way that Web3 solves a lot of problems, it's really twofold. First of all, it eliminates the toll collector role of traditional banks and traditional broker dealers. The main thing that they do is they employ large numbers of human beings maintaining ledgers of account and allocating credit for a fee. Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies do that without human beings and with no fee. And the elimination of minimum account balance fees, the $25 wire transfer fee that your bank charges to give you three days to send money abroad, those are gone. Okay, Thank you. That, that's what's so important. But the last part is, it unlocks value that traditional economic structures don't unlock the creator economy. 
play to earn in the gaming system. Those don't exist. So I want to go to Ms. Haas on that. Uh, building off this, in your testimony, you mentioned use cases for Web3 in the creator and gaming economies. Could you please outline a specific use case and discuss how Web3 can empower creators and artists over mega tech platforms, which was implied earlier? And quickly, please, if you could. All right, let's talk really quickly. I'll cite the one that we just talked about earlier, which is in the month of November, play to earn. So these are where video games, one can play a video game and earn NFTs. Those NFTs are in-game experiences. So if, if anyone here has young kids who are playing with Roblox, playing with Minecraft, playing with these, there's in-game experiences where you can buy avatars, you can buy various things. These can become NFTs. These NFTs then can be sold for value. And so what we're having here is these kind of the concept of a play to earn. You can play the video game, you can earn money, you can then monetize that back into fiat, and you can create these new economies and these new communities that have increasing value. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bankman-Fried, I believe you live in Hong Kong, is that correct? Uh, sorry, you read that? Do you live in Hong Kong, is that correct? Uh, I do not anymore. Oh, okay. Um, well, let me ask the question differently. I did at one point. <laughs> <laughs> so 10 years ago, certainly 20, 30 years ago, if you wanted to start a major internet company, you probably wanted to do it in the United States. You probably wanted to do it where you grew up, uh, in, in Stanford, on, 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 on the coast in Silicon Valley, uh, for a whole host of reasons, one of which being a very, very conducive, innovative environment. Um, when I look at Web3, I see a lot of projects moving overseas. To what degree is the current regulatory environment in the United States contributing to this change where projects are now being built and domiciled in nations not the United States, whereas in the previous versions of the internet they were? I do think it has contributed to that. I'm optimistic that we're going to see uh, changes to the framework over the next few years that will bring us into a world that can make the United States the source of the deepest and most liquid markets in the cryptocurrency ecosystem. I don't think we've seen that historically. And if you look at the you know difference between the volume distribution of crypto um, and digital assets versus most other industries, you can see that. Mr. Brooks, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, uh, Congressman, as I said earlier, there are certain activities that our G20 partners seem to think are perfectly appropriate, legitimate, and subject to regulation, and we keep resisting. Those have moved abroad. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. So uh, I want to turn to you. Thank you uh, for a moment, Mr. Brooks. Um, if, if you were king for a day and you were going to tell us uh, here's what you need to do to, to structure the regulatory framework. In, in a minute and 39 seconds, tell us what that would look like. I mean, I can barely introduce myself in a minute and 39 <laughs> seconds, Congressman. Uh, I come back to the concept of parity. I, I don't know why we believe that incumbent institutions are risk-free and anything new is highly risky. So if I have a platform built on a blockchain that is doing lending, I don't know why it's so hard for us to say that can participate in our banking system. If I decide that XRP is a security, why won't we let it list on a US exchange? The problem is we treat crypto assets differently from all other assets. And the answer is just recognize them for what they are. These are assets that represent some underlying activity. It could be a network, it could be an application. They have a value that people are willing to buy and sell at. Let them in. That would be my message, let them in. I thank the chairwoman, uh, and I thank all of you for being here today and testifying before us. Uh, I want to start in a general way, uh, and I'm thinking, Mr. Brooks, of, of what you said about the practice of law uh, when, with the advent of emails. I was a younger lawyer then and, and remember all the fears around it. Uh, and so, uh, as has been said, and this is really a follow-up to what Mr. Green asked long ago, hours ago. Uh, it's obviously clearly a fast-growing and a bit mysterious market. Uh, looking at the total cryptocurrency market cap over the last year, as some he here have reported, it exploded from about $500 billion a year ago to uh, now almost $3 trillion, uh, as of last month. But it's also clearly a volatile, fast-moving market. As of last night, the total market cap is back down closer to $2.4 trillion, Another example of volatility in Bitcoin, uh, which lost half of its value over just two days in March uh, before rebounding. So to that notion, uh, to the people uh, who find all of this a bit mysterious, 
Are we at risk? Are we, do we see warning signs uh, of a bubble in this marketplace, uh, if I'm allowed to call it that? What do we do to make sure uh, that the industry does not threaten the overall stability of our financial system? Uh, maybe, Mr. Brooks, I'll start with you. Thank you, Congresswoman. It's good to see you again. I I'll just give you a very quick uh, anecdote. When I was practicing law, I represented one of the largest mutual fund comp complexes in the United States, and in their market room, they had a chart, a physical chart, showing the U.S. equity market from 1792 to the present. What I remember about this room is it was a full city block long, and if you stood at the end of the room and looked at that chart, it was a straight line up and to the right. But if you walked right up close to the chart, you could very clearly see the Civil War and the Panic of 1907 yeah. and the Great Depression and all kinds of other volatility along the way. What I would tell you is, in the beginning of a fundamental technological revolution like this, the early days are going to see turbulence. But the long chart of crypto in only its 11-year history is up and to the right, just like the U.S. equity market. So what I would say is, there are risks, there's disclosures that ought to be had, there's framework regulation should be adopted. But the fact that the price goes up and down doesn't make it any different from U.S. equity markets in the first 100 years of the country's existence. Madam Chairwoman, um, as you may know, I serve as the ranking member on the Select Committee on the Economy along with Chairman Himes, uh, both of us also members of this committee. And we're holding uh, the first of two roundtables tomorrow on financial inclusion and access to banking uh, for underserved communities, a topic we talk a lot about also uh, in this committee and an issue uh, front of mind uh, for many underserved communities uh, around the United States. And so, Mr. Brooks, I'd love to get your thoughts on the relevance of today's topic for financial inclusion. Uh, and how the growth in digital assets and decentralized finance can actually drive inclusion, and can underserved communities benefit from these developments? Uh, I, I love that question, and thank you for giving me a chance to address it. A couple of things. So first of all, let's ask, why do we have so many underbanked people in the United States? And the answer is a combination of minimum balance fees, monthly account maintenance fees, and all kinds of other things that are a hallmark of the money center model that banking is built on, right? If you talk to Mr. Allaire about his product, he would tell you they don't have any minimum balance fees. They don't have any monthly maintenance fees. You can keep your assets in a tokenized bank deposit for free. So that's the first answer is there are no $10 a month fees. There are no $25 wire charges. Those things don't exist that eat away at your life savings, A. And B, the next most important thing about crypto is here you have an early stage asset which unlike the IPO boom, unlike venture capital, doesn't require that you know a guy or that you be well connected or that you be an accredited investor to participate. This is a chance for underrepresented communities to be in on the wealth creation stage of some new thing as opposed to coming in at the end. And so what I always say is that's the way you solve underrepresentation is through wealth creation. This is an opportunity and that is why there are more minority investors than white investors in crypto in the United States is because I, I appreciate your comments because I think in general technology is one of the key aspects that we have to really address some of the underserved communities. Uh, in the United States and agree with your comments. You may enjoy our hearing tomorrow on the Select Committee on the Economy. To build further, uh, what, what, are, what do you see as the main regulatory impediments uh, to further innovation in this space if we think it's really going to help us on the inclusionary aspect? It, it's all incumbency protection. The, the big banks don't like this. The big banks have been slow to adopt because they make a lot of money on those fees I just mentioned. Okay, so let, let me keep going with you if I can, Mr. Brooks, uh, in the time that we have. In your opening testimony, you talked about the do, not, do no harm approach. Uh, and that approach helped bring in a period of tremendous growth and opportunity in really Web 1. Uh, you mentioned that some of the countries that U.S. crypto uh, businesses are moving to, uh, what are some of the examples of the positive approaches to digital asset regulation that you see in those countries? You had to put your finger on it. Well, for, I mean, for example, responding to market demand. If, if a whole bunch of customers want to buy a Bitcoin ETF, why is it our business to say they can't do it? Right? I mean, you see this domestically, New York versus the rest of the United States. Lots of investors like to buy certain tokens. New York won't let New Yorkers buy tokens. So they're safe in Nebraska, not safe in New York. Why, why would that be? 